right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode four of the No Name Fit Game. I'm Andrew Ember, and alongside me, as always, it's the birthday boy, Elliot Brownstein. Woo woo! How you feeling? Uh, I need an IV. Yeah, yeah. I I don't usually party, but that was uh, pretty epic. That was your one night a year. That's my one night a year. That's it. All right. Well, for the second straight week, we have a guest host with us, Dr. Ben Backus. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, dudes. So we're going to talk about a lot of things, as always. You know, we have uh, a lot of diet, fitness, mental health talk. And as we've kind of become accustomed to, we always start off with something that's really, really on topic, right? I mean, last week we started off with aliens. We talked about Area 51 and that yes. craze and storming Area 51 and all that good stuff. So this week... It's another space theme here, but this one just intrigued me so much. I had to, I almost saved it for the wild and wacky, but I saw this story and I was like, we all almost just died. I don't know if you guys heard about this, but there was what they deemed a city killing asteroid that j apparently just missed Earth like a few days ago. Have you guys heard about this? No. No, this is news to me. So apparently, scientists didn't know until it was too late. They discovered this like way after the fact that they could do anything about it. Now, granted, it was tens of thousands of miles away, but in terms of a planet, missing an asteroid like this was a close shave so apparently they it was coming at fifty four thousand miles per hour just to kind of give some context here and in actual size they said it was wider than the statue of liberty is tall so they said like if this had made contact like this could have destroyed a city and they didn't know about it until two days before how big of a city i mean i don't know any well, city I mean, we could have been gone. <laughs> you got to you got to clarify on the city. I mean, were you talking about like Topeka, Kansas, or are we talking uh, <laughs> Los Angeles here? <laughs> that's, that's probably fair. going the municipal definition of a, yeah. of a city, like a, usually like a population hub of over I think a hundred thousand or yeah. over a city. Which right. Still, that's. I mean, this is my question. I mean, it was ten thousand miles away. You said tens of thousands of miles. Tens of thousands. But miles. still, okay. the, the way they sh they showed a diagram of this and and the collision path, like this was close. In terms of these I mean, objects, the, the vastness of space is is is, is impossible to comprehend. So exactly, the uh, order of ten thousand miles is, is tiny. Is, is, yeah, is nothing. I'm I'm shocked that I'm, I'm shocked that it didn't come that that that, it, that wasn't something that we've that we would have found much earlier. Usually, usually we track the we, you know we track those things. We understand the gravitational pulls of of all of the planetary bodies around and and how things get sucked in, and we can make calculations as to when these things are going to come that close. I'm surprised that one. Sounds like slipped through the cracks. That's my question. With all the advancements in technology, we, I mean, we're, we've come so far in so many different industries, they're just going to miss the fact that we almost got taken out by an asteroid. My thing is, 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 is space is so big. <laughs> right, of Indef course. Indefinite, you know, uh, that it, it's hard to, it, you can't get them all. You're right? going to give them a, a pass on this one. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, I mean, come on, it's it's space, you know. We don't know where it starts or begins or ends, you know. Well, how are you gonna be like, hey, you missed that one, you idiot, you know? <laughs> I mean, I'm not claiming I could do this job, but I no. feel like no, as you Ben said, a, you're gonna give him a pass. You know, it, it's, it's not more, like it's more surprising than anything else. I'm not. I'm, this Lord knows, I ain't gonna judge him for missing it. I wouldn't know. What, yeah, but oh. it's just like, wow, I thought I thought we had, and it's pretty far from Earth, like. I guess the trajectory was pretty epic, but I mean, it still missed us by a lot. I would recommend to check out this little GIF, so to speak, that they have on, on the internet of how close this came because it's wild to watch. It's basically our solar system. Did they name it? Yeah, it was like OK 2019 or something. Really? Yeah. That's what they went with? OK 2019? Something, yeah, something okay. generic. But basically, if you look at this image, it was crazy to watch the planet circling and then they bring up this, this asteroid and Earth, and just how close it was to them making direct contact. I'm definitely going to look into that tonight. I'm, I, my curiosity is peaked on that one. Where did you find that article? The it's Onion? A, it was, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was trending all over the news. Really? This is big news. Oh, man. But you can't find it? When it, when was it trending, like though? Like two day, a day yesterday? Yesterday? I two was days at ago. a commission yesterday. Well, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea what was going on yesterday. Elliot's trying to catch up here on, yeah. on everything he missed in society <laughs> yesterday. So I, I, I got one birthday a year, and, and, and the world almost ended? Jeez. You almost took us out. Oh, God. That would have been a, a good story. It. Hope it was worth it. <laughs> Elliot's still trying to catch up here. He's trying to Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for this right now because I need to see this. Because I'm, I'm a big, like, astronomy buff. Like, yeah, that's, that's interesting stuff, right? It's one of my favorite subjects. Um like I sucked at biology. I don't know why I kept failing that, but put astronomy and chemistry in the, in the mix, I'll be fine. <laughs> so I'll, I'm looking this up. 
right now. I have no idea where to find this. Okay, 2019. I, I mean, I don't know that that was the name of it. If you j just type in asteroid almost hits Earth, and you'll find it. Asteroid near Earth. Bruce Willis is going to pop up. Yeah, that's that's all I keep thinking about. Like, has Steven Armageddon Tyler. like ruined everyone's like perception of like asteroids hitting the Earth? <laughs> yeah. If by ruined you mean enhanced, then yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is one of Loki. I think that is one of the best movies. Like not not in terms of like actual Oscar quality, but man, that that movie, like that Independence Day, Men in Black, it has really. Whoa, whoa! I mean, what I mean, Men in Black was really good. <laughs> Wasn't there was? Was no, I'm saying all three of those were really. Oh good. yeah, Independence Day too. I could yeah. watch those on repeat. Yeah, no, I'm saying all all three of those really a gave the young me a very. Yeah, uh, very big misconception of what anything was actually like, but they were all three fun. They were all oh yeah. I mean, adventure, comedy. There was a little bit of romance and drama, and I loved it. I could <laughs> I, three you, great I could watch Men in Black and Independence Day back to back to back to back, but with Armageddon, I have to have a little breather because Bruce Willis dying at the end is a tearjerker. Spoiler alert! Very brutal. Spoiler! It's twenty years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you better have watched it. <laughs> so while Elliot's still struggling to find out about this asteroid here. Um, I think we should definitely take some time here to introduce Ben, start a little bit of the interview. That's what we always like to do with our guests, kind of, you know, let the audience know who's on with us and, and credentials and stuff like that. So uh, Dr. Ben Backus is clinical psychologist. Um, he also works at a ninja gym. So, I mean, this has become a common theme, obviously. I'm in the ninja community, so we brought on some ninjas on this show. But I think that that's a really fascinating uh, mixing of worlds there from psychology to ninja. I'm, the first thing I want to ask you about is what drew you to psychology, but we're going to get into ninja too. So while we have some time here, and Elliot's still trying to find out about the asteroid over there. I, I found it. I oh, found it. So you could, you? you could continue with the interview, but I'm, I'm just like, July 4th is when they found it, and then... It was 240 feet in diameter, which is huge. So you can educate over there as... as 54,000 miles an hour it was traveling. Yeah, right. And holy crap, did it miss Earth. Wow, that's crazy. Right? Yeah. No, it's pretty crazy. Save that page up for after this. I want to Yeah, I definitely will. I'm going to show you <laughs> that. My gosh. So as we wax poetic here on, on the um, incredible vastness of space and... And how close we all were to dying the other day. And how over all of our heads it truly is. Exactly. Uh, with No pun intended. <laughs> with with such, a, a, such a big topic there, you know, psychology is too. So, Ben, uh, what really got you into psychology in the first place? Oh, you know, I, I feel like that answer, the, the answer to that question changes depending on the day. And obviously it shouldn't. <laughs> um in all actuality, it was probably my dad. My, my father uh, was a licensed clinical psychologist in Austin, Texas, where I grew up. And, and hearing, his, uh, hearing his stories at the, at the dinner table, obviously, you know, he didn't, you know, he wasn't giving me full names or anything like that. But, he, but you know, I would ask. My mom was in. OK, so my mom was a phenomenal Italian chef. So I loved having that wasn't her job, but uh, she cooked great Italian food every night. And I loved um, I loved staying home most most weekends, even if not I mean um, even if not just the weeknights, uh, having dinner and then going and hanging out with my friends. And uh, so it was just the three of us because I was an only child, um, and we couldn't really ask her about her work because she was a gynecologist. So <laughs> didn't really make for good pasta primavera conversation. No. in terms of uh, you know postpartum, I'm, I don't even know what. So the. Uh, and, and Lord knows I, as a, you know, as a 10 or 11 year old, wasn't really getting into too much that was interesting. So I think part of the, not burden, but like part of, you know, my, my, my dad's experiences throughout the course of the day became, you know, pretty interesting and just, or, you know, carried a heavy load during the dinner. Uh, and it was just something I always found myself drawn to. And then in the year, um, oh, let me do the math real quick. 1997, not to, not to bring the, the podcast down. My grandfather uh, died by suicide. Wow. And it was on my mother's side and watching my dad kind of, uh, for lack of a better phrase, deftly maneuver and, and help my mom's side of the family deal with something like that and, and help myself deal with something like that was pretty impressive. And I think, I, I think a mixture of the, I guess the, the fascination with the human psyche, uh, and then couple that with, you know, the real world, um, helping people in distress. I think th those two things as a mix probably probably is what drew me to that. Interesting. That's I, I would imagine a lot of people when you ask like how do you get into something, what really drew you to it, 
a lot of times it's a, a major experience. So I think having the family suicide issue happen to you, that's got to be mind blowing. It's got to be something that really to almost deal with and, and watch someone, you know, deal with something like that. It was certainly very perspective changing. Right. Um, to see that. And I, and I think, I mean, the, the criteria that I, I work with a lot of clients who are trying to find what they want to do with their lives and, and, and the main things, the, the main questions I ask them are, do you enjoy it? Are you good at it? And how do you feel about, how do you feel about the impact that it, that it has? There's a lot of, a lot of people I work with, they might be good at what they do. They might have some enjoyment in what they do, but they're struggling to find meaning in it. You know, I'll work with someone who's a, I mean, not a Wall Street broker, but that's a, you know a pretty a pretty good kind of example of of, of a job that a lot, that kind of stereotypically doesn't have much meaning. There's not much, you know, the goal the goal of that profession is to make as much is to take as much money out of their pocket and put as much money into your pocket sure. as possible. I mean, money is I know they're printing money, but in order to make money in that field, you're taking it from somebody else. Sure, it's not this this you know this uh, infinite resource. And I have clients who do things not not that, but you know analogous to it and they're like i just i feel nothing I, this, this brings me no joy and so we find something that does and you know they, they aspire like oh look how much joy psychology brings or, or how much meaning psychology brings to you and I say, yeah but that you don't have to go that route i mean crime my, my I, I look at people like my tattoo I, I have a tattoo artist who's done most of the work um or at least he's done the, the he's done not most of the work on me, but he's done a, a good chunk of the work on me um and the meaning that, that like the experience that he gave me doing that, I didn't just walk into a parlor and was like, oh, give me the, you know, give me the barbed wire on the bicep. It was, it was like, hey, let's sit down. Let's make this art together. I saw, Elliot, I saw, you know, art on your arm that looked like it was pretty well thought out. And you, yeah. know, you want yeah. that to be a powerful experience. You don't want it oh, to it just be great. this random guy. You want it to be like, hey, thanks yeah. for connecting with me and understanding what this tattoo means to me. Yeah, this process for my tattoo uh, took about three weeks to a month before we actually sat down and 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 she was a good friend of mine uh who did the artwork uh danielle artness uh, artness colorworks and uh i mean we brainstormed really really well on what we want to do and you could tell the enjoyment factor that goes into yeah. it because she just doesn't want to be like what you said oh, i'll take number 39 like it's a sure. mcdonald's menu <laughs> you know yeah. so uh, I, I, I see what you're saying about that. And it's an, it's an intimate and vulnerable thing to get a tattoo. Like it's, you, you have to lie very still. And I have one, I mean, mine's on my, on my inner arm. Like you're, you're lying down, you don't have a shirt on and you can't move. And they, and it's, it's, it's vulnerable and intimate. It really is. And painful. Oh, oh. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't say the word, but yes, yeah. horrendously painful. Yeah. The inner arm. I, that's why I haven't done the inner arm yet. It's going to suck. I like if scared. you want to do it, like just, just get ready. It, it's awful. It's awful. I have, I have five and one of them didn't hurt three of them were kind of painful but that one just lit yeah. me lit me up it's man too scary and if i had an artist who i didn't feel like was connecting with me i mean i wouldn't have bailed because then i'd have half a tattoo on my arm but yeah. it just it would have been a it would have been an experience that i don't look back on and smile and i want to look back and smile and so i guess so psychologically you know he, he you know you don't have to be like some you don't have to be a shrink to find meaning in what you do you can find meaning in in anything that you, you know in, in almost anything and you do multiple things. I think this is an interesting uh, jumping off point to kind of connect the two. Um, so not only are you in psychology, but you're a Ninja Warrior coach at a very awesome facility that we've both trained at many times, uh, ATP, um, down in Fort Lauderdale. And but you're you're also good at like you're not just an athlete. Like you're you're a good athlete. Like I've Thank seen you, appreciate that. I've seen you medal in triathlons. Like I mean, so you're not just fooling around. You're not just trying to get in shape. Like you are good at what you do. So how do you balance? such a an intense you know i'm sure time consuming job of psychology with training training others you know this work life balance that you can keep up the ability to still be a medal contender in, in a very difficult type of race you know what's that work life balance for you Ooh, that's a good question um <laughs> well okay so i you know i have i have four jobs uh but each of the jobs in and of itself is part time. Like I don't have, I don't have not have four full time jobs. So one of the jobs I do is is with a website called Doctor on Demand, and I give I give tele I do teletherapy. I do that every day from nine to one. Um, then I, I have my private practice open from two to six. So those two right right there. I mean, there there's sort of your one full time job of being a therapist. Um, I coach Ninja Warrior one night a week for two hours, and if she needs help with some other stuff, uh, um, I'll I'll come in on like a Friday. But I treat my training as my coaching. Like I will, like I'll, I'll demonstrate moves, 
Um, I'll, you know, if, if someone is struggling with a, a lache or with a you know a, a salmon ladder, instead of saying here try this, I will I will say all right here watch watch how I do it. Look at look at this hand position or or look at how my body is swinging or or whatever. So and and I'll admit it, it's it's not. Um, you know, it's it serves it serves two purposes. It serves because I you know it serves me the getting that bit of that workout, but then it also it helps them. And I always at the end of every workout, I always construct a finisher um, that I that I have to participate in as well. Nice. It could be everyone has to do five rope climbs, or we have to. Um, I'll play follow the leader, and I'll go up the salmon ladder, and or down the devil steps, or or whatever. So I find ways to to kill two birds with one stone um, as frequently as possible. Um, and then teaching, I only teach, you know, I, I teach three, three classes per semester. Um, and then I just, I shave that, I shave a little bit off of my private practice. Um, and you know, some people who I would used to see once a week, maybe I'll see them twice every three weeks. And, uh, I'm, I'm lucky at this moment where I'm, I don't want to use the word lucky. I don't like that, but, uh, the way the cookies crumbled is a, a, a good chunk of my patients are what I would describe as the worried well. They have more existentially, you know, existential anxiety, or they have diagnoses that are simpler to simpler to work with, as opposed to some of the more intensive ones. Like your intensive ones are going to be eating disorders, which, which truth be told, I refer out, um, or some of the personality disorders. But a lot of people who seek therapy, I think it's a big misnomer. A lot of people who, not everyone who seeks therapy is well, no one's crazy. Okay, I can't say no one's crazy, but crazy is a rather pejorative term. But uh, the majority of my patients are aren't aren't diagnosed. I, I, I would not diagnose them if I have to for the purposes of insurance. I can find something that fits that. But most people are there because you know I'm I'm getting married and I have I have nervousness about what it's going to be like to commit to this person or you know I don't I don't have a substance abuse disorder, but I find myself having two or three drinks a night most nights and I'd like to see that decreased. Um, you know, people aren't coming in and saying I have bipolar disorder. I mean, people do, but psychology is, is, isn't just for the, the struggling. It's, it's a lot of times for people who just kind of want to, you know, kind of smooth out the edges. Be a little happier, you think? Yeah. Be a little more happy, find meaning, find peace. I mean, don't get me wrong. I still, I still have the clients who, who each day is a struggle. Um, but you know, my, I, I, my caseload in being in the private practice tends to cater more towards. Um, those people who, you know, are holding down nine to fives as, as opposed to the people like, I mean, if, if someone with schizophrenic in my office, I would, I would probably refer them out. I would, I would say, you know, I, I think you need something more intensive. I think you're probably going to need inpatient treatment unless you are, unless you're medicated, uh, at the moment, because if, I mean, if someone's actively hallucinating, there's, there's no words I can say. I don't say things to them and say, oh, well, I, I don't see the dragon anymore. Thanks for the, you know, thanks. <laughs> no magic, right? Yeah. yeah. It's there, there, there are, that's the main thing about therapy is there are no magic words. So Interesting. Someone's just coming and fix me, you know. Well, it's just, unfortunately, it's not going to work that way. Right. Now, I was actually going to ask this. I'm, I'm switching the order that I had written down questions because the way, you brought up a really interesting point that I had actually written down to ask later. But I think it it, it makes a lot of sense now. And and now I'm curious if you're even if you'd even keep a patient like this. So I'm curious because you say you have a lot of um, average Joes, so to speak, people who don't have a lot of people who don't have major problems. They just want to be a, a little bit happier. And, mm -hmm. and like you said, you said smooth out the edges for an example. Um, what happens when you bring in or when someone comes in and they are low? Like I'm talking, um, they come in and they say, Ben, like nothing's going right. I don't have friends. I don't have family. Um, I'm not happy. And I don't know what to do. What do you do in a situation where someone comes in that low? And I know this is a very difficult question, but I'm very it's curious. It's not difficult. It's, it's, it's a very open-ended question. Sure. Um, if someone came, if someone came to me and, and said that, I, I would, I would. Well, the the first therapy session is 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 an intake where we talk about what it, what it, what are these specific symptoms you're you're experiencing. Um, symptoms can be you know anxiety. It can be physiological in nature sweating, heart racing, more panic attack kind of stuff. Or, uh, then we'll get into the emotional symptoms, anxiety, sadness, fear, anger, guilt, resentment, um, how, how often they experience things. Then I'll sort of get more into what's your diet look like. Not your diet is in tell me how healthy you're eating. Uh, so actually take the word diet out. Um, <laughs> what's your appetite? What's your appetite and what's your sleep? Because two of the big things that get hit hard during depression are, are sleep and appetite. So after I sort of conduct a basic you know, try to get a basic understanding of what their life looks like. Then we'll say, okay, I want you, I want you to, we're, we're going to get into a time machine. We're going to go, we're going to go one year in the future. And the, my time machine, 
uh, to get a year in the future in my particular time machine takes about five minutes. So we have five minutes while we're sitting in the time machine. And I want to know what you hope to see. Your goal as a, as a client is to fire me. My goal as a therapist is for you to fire me just to say, hey, I don't need you anymore. Like, we're done. Sure. Like, and I, and I, my favorite thing is when someone says, hey, I don't need you anymore. We're done. And I say, cool. You got my number. Call me when you need it. And and they never do. And that's great. Um, so I'll say, no, what do you- I honestly I hate to cut you off, but I mean, off, that, no. that's something I've never heard before. The fire me thing? Yeah. And, that, and that's enlightening to hear because it's like, you know, you, you don't think about it like that. You don't think about a therapist saying, hey, my job is to get fired. <laughs> hey, their job is when their you job know, is done, who, they've done their job. Who That's the it. heck says that ever? You know, my job is to be fired. But you know, it, it, it's it, true. Clearly, for you know, I guess your your business world, it's it's not it's you're truly trying to take care of people. Mm-hmm. And and it, and, the, and the way you take care of someone is, God, it's such a cheesy term, but <laughs> helping them help them to take care of themselves, or else I'd be stuck. You know, you know, I would get twenty five clients. You know, once I build my case with 25 clients, I'm set for life. And now I only help 25 people. You know, I, I, I probably have I probably have one new call a week of someone who found me through insurance or through a friend, of, you know, a friend of someone who I treated before. So it kind of behooves me to to kind of to kind of churn people out. Um, and so the goal that I always say is and, and look, I'm, I'm 32 years old. I have I have as much wisdom as nothing. You know, like I, I don't know the way the world works and I certainly am not going to try to pretend to. But it's my goal to to internalize, I want them to internalize my pattern of thinking that's based on, and not, not my pattern of thinking, but, but a pattern of thinking that we establish that's a bit more adaptive, where we observe their thoughts, their feelings, their behaviors, their values, and, and, we, see, and we see how those, how those align, if that, if that makes sense. For sure. I'm going to ask one more, and then we're going to get away from it, and then we're going to come back. I love breaking things up here, having cool, a little fun every now and then. This one I'm curious about, though. This one really got me. Every week on this show, we send out a number of inquiries for questions because we love helping people. We want to know what's on your mind. How can we help you? Let's talk about something that is is a concern of yours so that we can take care of their problems. We had Kai on last week, uh, a vegan ninja warrior, so he had a couple specialties. Half a dozen questions came in. I put out a feeler multiple times this week that we had uh, a psychologist coming on the show. If you have any general mental health thoughts in your brain, hit us up. Nothing. Zero. All week on multiple platforms. And I want to throw this your way, Ben, obviously. Talk about mental health stigma because this this is what I think it is to me because there's no way that every single person who saw that message said i'm perfectly fine mental health wise i have there's nothing wrong in my life i'm perfectly happy in fact i would say it's probably the opposite there's probably plenty of people who have some sadness in their life who something they, something could be better but yet not a single person reached out and and wanted to make it public and i even said like if you want to message me and we can we can read it anonymously whatever you're comfortable with we'll do it like that not a single person reached out so i thought it was very interesting and i think it's very telling that mental health is still so much it's looked at so much differently than a, a physical health checkup like everyone goes to the doctor you're not going to hide the fact that i'm going to get a blood test and see what's wrong with me in in my my bloodstream but when it comes to mental health it's i still feel like there's a stigma there, there very much is, and I mean, look, you can take the most, you, know, you, can, you can take the most depressed person and have them stand next to a perfectly, a perfectly fine individual. You're not gonna be able to tell the difference. I mean, you can look at body language, but if, but if I tell both of them stand up straight and put on a suit, they'll be able to do it. Sure. But you know, if I, but so there, there's a bit of what I guess you could almost call deniability that you can go through with the mental health. Whereas if I, you know, if you have a broken arm or if I show you a test that your blood is know hyper hypo something i don't know sure i'm not that kind of doctor um that's a bit that's a bit harder to to refute um to me and 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 it's easier to explain i can say oh look your blood cell count is x because and and the reason for that is is y and there's not much of an argument that gets to take place and that says nothing about who you are as a person whether or not my arm is broken or i have or i have type 1 diabetes that you know that, that doesn't indicate anything about my strength of will or whatever. Interesting. And and people sort of in that mental health or who struggle with mental health, it's it gets it, it gets a bit trickier. To me, a stigma, um, I mean the big stigma that we I don't know how old you guys I think we're all probably I'm guessing we're all around the same. Thirty age. hit work, yeah. Um you know the big the big stigma that was around around the time that we were being born was was AIDS in this country. That was the big stigma. That was the big taboo. Um, and it back when it was called GRID, it was a gay related immunodeficiency. Hmm. And, and I think the, the big stigma was there 
in part uh, because of the homosexual aspect of it, and we certainly weren't as progressive then as we are now. We still have a long way to go, but that's a, a different story, obviously. Sure. Um, but it's it's just something that wasn't well um, it wasn't well understood. So what a lot of people do when when you don't understand something, you assign a supernatural explanation to it. I think that's where a lot of polytheism came from. Uh, I don't understand the sun and the moon and the tides uh, because I am I'm a Persian farmer in 1500 BC and I, and I have and for me to accept the fact I don't want to accept the fact that I have no control over any of this at all. That's horrifying. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to create gods uh, who I can pray to, who I can at least talk to, and then you know I I I'll feel like I have some sort of of control over the situation and. It'll be, it, you know, it, it's up to them in the end, as opposed to it being a, a, a dark and, and, you know, whether it's a drought or a, or a deluge, you know, in reality, it's meaningless. It means nothing. And that's I think that terrifies people. So so they assign these bigger spiritual explanations to kind of give them comfort at night. Mm-hmm. Um, so to me, a stigma and a taboo, which are two terms that I that I equate, uh, comes from really giving a I'm not going to say supernatural, but it, it could be supernatural, giving 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 an explanation for something that is scientific that we just don't have the science for yet. And now we do have the science to explain um, mental health and mental and mental illness. But having science and having the general public embrace that science are two very, very different things if you watch the news for, you know, two freaking minutes. Um, <laughs> so, so to me, a, a lot of, I mean, a, a lot of it really comes down to um, this idea that if, if you if you have a mental illness, you you are weak, and it's because it's because people don't understand and, and, and do the research to, to see that oh no it's a, it's it's a it's a dopamine or a serotonin um, either too much or too little it's some sort of chemical imbalance there along with along with other things as, as well. But I mean I don't think this is where it's tough. I I, I don't believe truly in, in that medical model of it's completely out of our control. I, b- I believe that, that we do have some sort of control by going, I mean, I've, if we had no control, the therapy would be, would be pointless. Sure. And I'd just, I'd be, I would have talked myself out of a job at this point. <laughs> um, but we, we do, we do have, you know, when you have a mental illness, you have to take ownership of that and you have to work to get your way through it. You can still see yourself in a way as a victim of it, but you can't approach it with that victim mentality that you could with a broken arm. If I break my arm for the first X amount of months, there's no rehab. It's just, I got to leave my arm like this. Um, but if I have depression, the obligation for me to take care of myself starts immediately. And I think that I think that um, scares people a little bit. Very interesting. Ellie, are you cool jumping out or do you want to get in on that? I no, no, a, I mean, OK, mm, yeah, we're coming back. But I just I love to break things up here. So, yeah, I don't blame you. Fascinating. So and this is I mean, this is deep in a way that Ninja Warrior just isn't. I mean, like we're talking we're talking to a lot of people out there who are going to be either listening this week or in the future and you know people are down and there's a lot going on we're going to jump back into all the things going on in our society potentially that you know just are causing a lot of stress and anxiety but this is big stuff this is very heavy stuff so um let's get light for a second and let's jump into the wild and wacky so you know anyone who's listening to the show knows we're bringing in crazy stories from around the world that just caught my attention open it up for open-ended discussion i usually ask elliot what's the the closest thing he's ever done to experiencing one of these stories here but (laughs) let's see what we got this week so our first story uh driver tries to avoid ticket by using red sports drink as taillight this is from denver colorado police say a driver tried to replace a broken taillight with a red sports drink Longmount police stopped a driver Monday who placed a red-colored bottle drink where his car's rear light should have been. Authorities say the driver was on his way to get the taillight fixed when officers stopped him in Longmount, 38 miles north of Denver. Officials say officers didn't ticket the driver who was seen repairing his car later that day. So I think my biggest question is how long was this going on? Because they got him as he was getting it replaced. So did they just happen? I mean, perhaps. But at the same time, if I was going to get it replaced in that in that very moment... Uh, I don't think I'd bother to put the the tail light in there. I think I would just go to get it replaced. I'm guessing he did that for a while, and then he was just waiting to get pulled over. <laughs> so then he so then he would say, "I'm going to get it replaced." And then he would just go do it in that moment. I think that's a pretty good call, Elliot. Oh yeah, the, everybody uses that. Oh yeah, I was just about to go. It's on my it. way. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was just I was just going there. Never that's mind, like 38 <laughs> miles out of out of town, going <laughs> going the other direction. So that's like, like okay. my seatbelt. Like my seatbelt was broken for a while, and then I got pulled over and like, why did you seatbelt? I was like, oh, it's broken. Like you gonna fix? I was like, yeah, I'm on my way. Did yeah. it work? 
Yeah, of course it worked. I mean, they're, they're not going to call you a liar. Right. You know? And I was just like, yeah, I'm on my way. I was like, it's just, you know, it's a seatbelt, so they have to schedule an appointment. So it took a while. <laughs> Saturday and, you know, at 11 o'clock at night. Yeah, I'm driving to the seatbelt store. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, I was lucky it was in the day, so, you know. So. so I assume it was a Gatorade or Powerade. So what they yeah. what he should have used is he should have used Red Bull because then if he got pulled over, hit a button, Red Bull gives you wings, you just fly the way, man. Oh, man. <laughs> It's so bad. I'm Too sorry. good. I'm it's so a, sorry. It's a very bad joke. <laughs> <laughs> very, very bad joke. I still say we need the Price is Right horn to go, mm, 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 Oh, burn. yeah. <laughs> wah, 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 wah. <laughs> Our second story. Let's see if we can do a little better. Iowa official ousted after singing Tupac Shakur's praises to coworkers. From Iowa City, Iowa. The director of Iowa's social services agency was a huge fan of the late rapper Tupac Shakur, and he frequently let his subordinates know it. Emails obtained by the Associated Press show that Iowa Department of Human Services Director Jerry Foxhoven routinely sent messages to employees lauding Shakur's music and lyrics, even after at least one complaint to lawmakers. Then last month, he sent out another such email to all 4,300 agency employees. <laughs> he was abruptly ousted from his job the next workday. Foxhoven, 66 told employees that he had been a huge fan of the hip-hop artist for years. He hosted weekly Tupac Fridays to play his music in the office. He traded lyrics with employees, and he marked his own 65th birthday with Shakur-themed cookies, including ones decorated with the words Thug Life. <laughs> I love that story every time I hear that. It gets better and better. Each oh, time. have you heard this one? Yeah, of course. Like it's It, it was a pretty huge story. Yeah? Yeah, it was a Twitter trend, even. Okay, so we picked it up a little bit late, but that's okay. It's this, okay, yeah. It's, it's purpose it's still of the wild wacky is to share this with people who, who weren't wow. trending I, on Twitter. I I mean, I'm, I'm not on social media, so I had no clue. That is, oh boy, that's that's pretty rough. I mean, How I, would you diagnose that? <laughs> you know, a celebrity, I, I actually, I, I, I teach, and I, I taught intro to, intro to um, psychology in one of the presentations I have my students do, is I, I, I'm a very open-ended teacher, and I just and I just said, um, your presentation is to be called The Psychology of Blank. I don't care what you do. I mean, you get, get approval from me. Like, sure. You're not going to say, like, the psychology of canoes. Like, there's nothing there. <laughs> but someone chose celebrity stalking. Wow. Um, and and obviously, he's not stalking Tupac Shakur because he's been passed away for 30, I don't know, 30 many years. Many years. Many, yeah. many years. Yeah. Um, but that level of celebrity obsession is 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 fascinating. Like, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I have my I have my celebrities who I who I think are are just incredible incredible listening whether it's musically like you know system of a down or breaking benjamin or, sure or i listen to a lot of stand-up comedy and there are guys like bo burnham and pete holmes and kyle canane who i just who i think are absolutely incredible but but they're they're to send an email out to my coworkers, that, that, that that's it doesn't feel like it's just i like this person so much and i want everyone to like this person so much it feels like there's there's something else there yeah I, I want people to know how much I like this. Yeah, it, there's a bit of image control or image management going on in there. And Interesting. And I, he's certainly not doing it very well. If people are saying, "Dude, all right, we get it. Like, just just go ahead and stop." Yeah, Elliot, if this was you and you were sending out emails to 4,300 of your closest uh, coworkers, which celebrity would it be? Oh, uh, this is me. Uh, the story is about me. Oh, great. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I have I have no issue with it. Like, I I love Tupac. We like, all do. Like who? Who would have an issue with this guy just trying to celebrate some music? You know, like and the I mean, cook, the I cookie can deal thing with is the, thug the life cook, cookies. The cookie thing is awesome idea. Like the guy just really likes Tupac. Obviously, he's not like <laughs> he seems harmless. I mean, yeah, yes, like, it's not like he was sending out threatening messages. He's sending out leery. Like, I think, well, we don't, we do not know the content of the email. The well, email, the email may have this said, is true. "My fofo going to make sure all your kids don't grow <laughs> no. if you don't also like Tupac <laughs> Chico or something." Well, I, I mean, because I read a lot of stories on it. it, it was nothing threatening in any nature. You know, he threw out lyrics and stuff like that, and we all know Tupac's music wasn't wasn't the cleanest. You know, but I don't see an issue with with anything because it's Just like you know. Delete. Delete. Like yeah, it, they no said, you know, even after lawmakers had been informed that he had, that he had done this, like who informed the police that right. their boss sent? That's a snitch to me. It sounds like a snitch. Uh, I, they I get don't, stitches. Yeah. Like that person, I have, I have more concern for that person's mental health. Uh, That's right, the fascinating. Per, the the person, person who ratted. Well, because it's it's not like you're you're kind of bumming out the guy that's trying to be happy in his life. Like he's 66, he's gonna croak in 20 years, you know, and. The thing is, it's like, 
let it, let him live. Let him be happy. He's doing something that is an enjoyment. He wants to share yeah. this to you. I mean, hey, what, what was, person? What was the frequency of the emails? That's a good question. I don't have it that was, here. It was like every Friday. Every oh come on! I guess yeah. if it was like five a day. Like yeah, yeah, someone should say, "Hey man, like you're not you don't have much time to do like work." Yeah, but if it's once a week, just all right. My buddy, my buddy likes Tupac a lot. Let's just let's it's, it's my boss. Let's just. Yeah, my on. thing is like, how many people in that office pretty much like Tupac as well? Like, I'm sure a good portion of and them I, like, them, like them. I read more from the story that he was quoting stuff like the world needs to make changes. Like he was quoting positive type lyrics. So yeah, I didn't get not that. To, not time. to open a can of worms. What I I wonder what race he was. And he I, was white. I mean, the, the, the name sounded that. I yeah, didn't, he I didn't want to be like, oh, it sounds like a white guy. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, he was white. And I, I, I wonder of the 4,300 people, how many of them were were of a, were of a different race. And the, and the person who said something, I wonder if that I wonder mm. if that played a role in any of it, or if it's, or if it wasn't if it wasn't that important. Mm. Third and final story: Guardian Angel Pigeon helps driver avoid speeding ticket from Berlin. Police in Western Germany say divine intervention saved a speeding driver from getting a ticket after a pigeon photobombed a traffic enforcement camera at just the right moment. Just as the radar clocked the driver at 54 kilometers an hour in a 30 kilometer an hour zone and the camera flashed. 30 kilometers an hour? Jesus. Really? that's, That's 18 miles an hour. Yeah. That's super slow. Very. Uh, the pigeon flew in front of the car, obscuring the face of the driver with its spread wings and thereby concealing the necessary evidence of who was at the wheel. Police say thanks to the feathered guardian angel, the driver was spared a $117 fine, but should take it as a sign from above to slow down. Well, he doesn't know who he is. That, that guy doesn't know who he is. He's just some dude who didn't get a ticket. He has no clue. That's true. Now, I think that's really interesting because that could never happen here because here you, they just take a picture of your... Uh, your license plate and they don't care what you look like as far as i know well it sounds it sounds like that's what that's what was obscured like the pigeon was in the no right. it was his face they literally oh, it was, it was his just his, in front of his face and apparently that took away the evidence they needed huh so they do facial recognition tickets there i guess i wow. think i think that's the that's, that, that's the story to me is is the fact that they're they doing facial face. recognition that feels a bit invasive yeah that feels a bit invasive um it reminds me. I thought it was going in a very different direction, and I was going to get on an interesting soapbox about how similar animals are to us, and how they there's a field of subfield of psychology called comparative psychology that talks about how animals experience a lot more complex emotions and cognitions and language than we give them credit for. And I was going to hop on that soapbox, but then it was clearly just a thing of timing. Yeah, complete so all, timing. All it reminds me of is the um, Randy Johnson. Oh god. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The pitch with the pigeon the exploded. Most, the most oh. insane. Moment Timing. in sports. That's, I mean, that, that we're talking thousandths of a second. Everybody thought like the bollocks, like was like a confetti ball. Yeah. yeah, like like what happened, and they realized that he hit a bird. It was pretty awesome. <laughs> Except I mean, for the not bird. for the bird. I mean, but <laughs> that bird that was a, it was a quick death. I'm sure of it. Yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, that bird didn't feel too much. It was pretty awesome. To yeah, see, I mean, like, I think that's interesting. Of all like the low odds in this world, like to hit a bird that just happens to be flying by in an, a stadium in the middle of you, you know, know. But you know what we compare it to? The the asteroid hitting uh <laughs> the asteroid almost hitting Earth. I mean, right? Think about the size of a stadium. Think about the size of a baseball, and think about the speed of the baseball and a bird. In order for that to happen, that I mean, we're we're talking on orders of billions but yeah. when billions of pitches are being thrown um yeah it's, it's bound to happen just like an asteroid yeah. potentially coming our way and i, I, I imagine I'm, I'm sure they're i'm sure i'm gonna butcher it by an order of billions <laughs> but like i've I, you know you, you've read like oh you know you take an empty football field put i i think what they said what they what they said it was like if, you, if you're trying to emulate a i don't remember if it was a molecule or if it was it or an, sorry an atom or if it was the solar system but like go into an empty football field you put a grain of sand in the middle of the field that is the sun in in the milky way galaxy wow like it's just it's so tiny so That's insane. yeah so for something to hit and, and, and we see the sun is, is huge so for something to hit the earth yeah i mean just the the odds are crazy but you know pigeons and pigeons and baseballs are are planets and asteroids <laughs> it's on a different scale that's so profound i don't know if i can get over that i can't pigeons and galaxies it's very odd combo. <laughs> Pigeons and galaxies. I'm, I'm just trying to make up for my Red Bull joke that I was sincerely proud of when I, when I made it. I was, I was you hoping still for have a lot than, to make up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. See if I can dig myself out of this hole. So, as always, wild and wacky, living up to the name. Um, so, we owe Rudy an answer this week on the show. He asked a question last week. We weren't able to get to it, so we have to answer it on this week's show. Uh, Rudy was um, – he asked – the podcast last week um 
when you don't have time to cook. So like he he, he gets his workout yes. in, super busy. Um, he needs a post workout meal when he can't cook and he has to eat out somewhere. Um, and he asked us for our opinions there. Now I. I'm not a fan of uh, of going to restaurants. You know, in all situations, if I can cook, I know what's in it. It's obviously going to be the healthier decision. But I understand not everyone's in the same boat. Sometimes they need a quick source of something, but they don't want to, you know, blow a huge caloric intake on on one meal here. So I think you just got to be smart in these situations. Like there are places that are clearly better than others. I mean, I've been to uh, Bole many times, and they give you I options. Love to, yeah, like there's there's healthier options there. I mean, granted, you're not going to know what's in that sauce. They might have a ton of extra stuff, the additives, and you know, it, it's not the perfect solution. But it's it's choosing a bolle over a McDonald's or something of that caliber that that makes you can the still difference. have McDonald's. You can. Yeah. Well, what do you mean, you or you? Well, how how did you say you? <laughs> you. <laughs> well, give your thoughts here, Elliot. No, I mean, you, you can have whatever you want. Okay, if you don't have time, you can have whatever you want. It's it's making sure that you have the time or or the proper meal structure 90% of the time of your life you know if you you want to go have a mcdonald's that's fine but, but know your limits don't order nine uh, uh quarter pounders of cheese and uh 20 mcnuggets but I, I mean i may be reading this wrong but i think his question was more like i if i have to do this i'm not looking for a cheat meal i'm not looking for whatever i want right. what's and, my healthiest and, option? and that's what i mean it's like you know i can't tell you how many times through through my weight loss process and processes and stuff like that i went to mcdonald's and i ordered a, a six-piece happy meal with apples and a water and and I'm not even lying. Like I even have a post on my Instagram. Went to went to McDonald's and Happy Meal, you know. Because <laughs> okay, so you got yeah. They're it's processed, disgusting chicken nuggets. Okay, but it's still chicken. Uh, it, they've gone a lot healthier with with their nuggets somewhat. Uh, apples are great for your body. Um, you're not pounding 45 of those, you know, chicken McNuggets. It was only six of them. The apples were great. I didn't get any fries. I asked for extra apples instead, and I and I had water. The main the main drink you should have in your life. So I wonder how many people go to a McDonald's and they say Happy Meal, extra apples and water. Yeah, they looked at me like an yeah, for a twenty eight year old, you know. So, not me, I was gonna say just at that point in time, just I, I respect what you're doing, but yeah, I was they, I was gonna think just just go to the grocery store that's next door. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it was I was uh, I was pretty disappointed though when they put the toy in there for me too and i was like i don't need the toy i was like I just what was it though i can't remember what it was oh. oh you know what i think it was like a little plush thing it was, mm-hmm. it was i was real mad was it a teeny beanie baby i think so well was maybe, it, maybe they thought they were getting it for you were getting it for your kid maybe but, but was he in the car no no <laughs> no he was not it was, it was like it was like 11 o'clock at night and i was like yeah i need a big th- i need a happy meal okay you know? that was that was my option like you don't have to shy away. You could go anywhere you want as long as you make the right decisions. And like I say, always with my diet plans, and make sure you have this with this and this. It's not about the food. It's making sure that you have the proper protein, carb, and uh, fat intake with water. So, ben, I know we didn't you know, give you any guidance that this is coming, but feel free to chime in if there's anything you would suggest to Rudy. If you've ever been in a pinch, are you ever in that situation where you oh, yeah, got to get? I, I, haven't e- I haven't eaten since uh, <laughs> since nine o'clock this morning. <laughs> so yes, I am in that pinch. The, the easy to me, the easy solution is keep a box of. Like, I, think, I think what I would do is keep a box of granola bars, or I love little fruit snacks. Just keep a box of granola bars or fruit snacks in your uh, in your trunk or something. I got a Quest bar on me right now. Absolutely. Uh, honestly, uh, my favorite thing is is besides the six piece happy meal, uh, <laughs> is to go to you know racetrack or Wawa and. I go there. I grab the um, Jack Links beef jerky, twenty three grams of protein in it. It's only like, it's like two for five bucks, and you get four uh, steak meats, and f- all that protein plus a cheese stick for a dollar, and and uh, like an apple for you know or a, ban- a banana. Usually I get a banana because all that sodium. I want to throw a banana on there uh, for like sixty nine cents, and th- and that's a good meal with some water. It's beef, unconventional, but it, beef it, jerky is so good for you. It's such an underrated product. So, Rudy, hopefully that gives you a little bit of, uh, of something to go on there. Um, I want to jump back in to the interview with Ben, talking a few more things about psychology before you know we do some more general stuff and 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 finish up after that. This I'm so curious to get your opinion on because I know you're a sports fan. Yes, and I think you briefly mentioned this term before, and and I smiled because I have this written down. and I wanted to talk about it. You mentioned the word luck. And then you kind of like brought it back at one point. 
Hmm. My, my question to you is luck in sports via psychology. So, like, I might stand up, and if the Panthers are playing on the road and they score a goal, I might stay standing for the rest of the game, even though I know that's crazy. Where is where do you stand on sports being a, and, and luck in sports being a psychologist? I know you love your Spurs and teams like that. Are you going to stand up for the whole game if your boy is going off? If Aldridge is having, you know, heating up from from downtown, you know? What's your call on, on luck in sports as a psychologist? Uh, so th- there's there's two different things you, I think we look at. <laughs> we look at – so we're talking about superstition, essentially. True. Um, yes. I'm going to look at player superstition, and I'm going to look at fan superstition. Yes. And player superstition, I think there is something to that. I don't believe any of it actually there, – there, there's any cosmic thing about it, but I do know, you know, Michael Jordan wore a, p- a pair of uh, – I think I think he wore Carolina shorts, right? Yeah, his Carolina shorts under his under his uh, Bulls shorts. I think uh, I think Tim Duncan did the same with Wake Forest and his and his shorts. And I think that actually can have some sort of effect. I think that puts you in a mindset of um, not that like feeling lucky makes you lucky, like it's a placebo or something. But well, I don't know. Maybe maybe in a sense it does. If I shoot a ball with confidence, I think I think that ball. If you put me in a free throw line and you have me shoot 100 free throws, I think I would probably make at my peak. I think I'd probably make 85 of them. Now, probably down to like 65. I haven't gotten to play in a while. And that would be me feeling neutral to good about it. But if I stepped to a free throw line and I did not have that confidence, I think the ball would go in less. Um, so I think player luck is is a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. But you were referring to, to team luck. Or yeah, team, fan. Sorry, to fan, fan luck. Um, I think that's getting I, – I think, I think fan luck is about two things. I think it's about – uh, camaraderie with other fans because in, in the end as much as I love sports it's a it, it, it is meant to I don't want to call it a distraction that's going to sound like I'm like you know say oh the Illuminati's real and they're just making sports to uh <laughs> you know to distract us from all that stuff but but I, I that's what I believe sports and movies and music are are there for is to is to help give our life what I would call casual meaning you know you'll you'll get deeper meaning from you know Whatever your spirituality is, or lack thereof, I don't, I'm, I'm not a particularly spiritual guy, but I still find meaning in in my existence. Um, but so that's like that deeper level of meaning. But then there's a casual level of meaning. Participating in sports, I like this band. I, you know, I like that. Sure. That, that gives it some sort of meaning, and we want to have some sort of control over our over over that thing that we identify with. Um, so I think it's I think it's a bit of kind of wanting to control and and then feel like I'm part of it. Like when, when it gets right down to it. As much as I love the San Antonio Spurs, and I have a Spurs tattoo on my leg, and I'm very proud of it still to this day, but my opinion of of the Spurs or of of, of sports has changed because I got this probably 10 years ago when I was when I'm like, oh my god, I'm gonna live and die by the Spurs, and I'm like, no, I'm gonna live and die by whether or not I'm able to make money, and and you know pay bills and stuff like that. Um, so I've I've definitely scaled back my intense my my passion about. A sports game going a certain way, but I mean, it'll, I'm, I'll, I won't lie. I was still pretty pissed off this past year when the Patriots won yet another Super Bowl. So <laughs> that only goes so far. I think it's about just kind of want to participate and have fun. Like if I stood up, I'll, I'll put it this way: if DeRozan or whoever was was heating up and everyone stood up, I would gladly stand up and participate. And I'd be like, "Oh, we're we're not going to sit down until he misses or whatever." And that's fun. If I was the only one who was doing it, I'd be like, "All right, like." It's not even a social pressure thing. It's just a, I'm doing it because this is a fun moment that we're all participating in. Yeah, I was more talking about like if you're in your house and your wife's around and your pets are all over the place and you go to the bathroom and all of a sudden they go on a 10-0 run, are you going to be like, I wonder if I should stay in the bathroom? Oh, um... And you come out and they get trounced. Like, are you, is that entering your mind or are you, now that you're you know into psychology and you understand that these things are crazy, you know, you're like... It's, I'm wondering how you it's you it's, it's crazy yourself. and there's no there's no influence that I'm having. I think it comes down to will I do something different? Yeah, but it would be it would be it would be because I'm embracing the silliness and, okay. I, and, I, and I'm living in that moment. Like if I put on my my Tim Duncan jersey and all of a sudden they start playing well, I'm going to keep doing that because because there's no harm in it. But like let's say let's say I'm I'm eating some hot soup and I spill hot soup on my on my crotch and all of a sudden <laughs> someone makes a three and I'm like oh crap I gotta pour this on myself <laughs> every time we're on offense you know um, <laughs> so so you know it's 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 just about participating in that moment but I mean like my my wife does that she she's a big Pittsburgh Penguins fan and and she'll have <gasps> uh, <gasps> not the favorite team oh, of the, the podcast because they've been the ones who have held you guys back clearly 
Oh, 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 oh. I'm a Flyers fan. Uh, oh, you're a Flyers uh, fan. Yeah, I'm a oh, Flyers fan. Okay, that's actually, worse yes. for him. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Never mind. There is there is Panthers Nation over here, but yeah, Elliot's a Flyers. Th- that's fan. actually a relevant boo. <laughs> but you actually have the 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 right. I'll tell you what though, I'm super super superstitious. I am. Yeah. I have to. Yeah. It's it like like the Eagles. I watch I watch Silver Linings Playbook before each game. Good lord. Good movie. Is, it what? is a great movie. Good lord. That's OCD, Daddy. Shouldn't be doing that. Uh, <laughs> But I watch that. I have my own Eagles outfit that I wear every Sunday. Now, the, the okay, so the year they, they won the Super Bowl, which is only two years ago, 2017, right? So the year they won the Super Bowl, first game of the season, I had my my get up, you know, uh, my Dominic McNabb jersey, my Eagles pants, my Eagles shoes, my Eagles socks, and my Eagles hat. The second week of the season, because uh, they won the first week, the second week of the season. Is that when Wentz went out? Uh, no, Wentz went out like nine or ten. Week nine. Or 10. Yeah, week thirteen. Um, so week two, they lost. But I was up at Legoland that day, and we were we were. I made sure I caught the game too because I, I wasn't going to miss the game. I, we left Legoland so I could watch the game, and uh, because I'm a, a psychopath, <laughs> but I wasn't wearing my outfit, and they lost, which is weird. Okay, and I didn't catch on to this until because like you know I wanted to wear my outfit every week. So I started wearing the outfit every week, and we were winning, 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 winning. The game that they lost to the Seattle Seahawks, um, my pants were dirty. Some sauce got on them, all right? Some really good tomato sauce. And we lost that game because I was wearing my black pants. Okay, and I remember specifically. And then the game that Wentz went out, so my ex-girlfriend, at the, my girlfriend at the time, she bought me new Eagle shoes. So she's like, put them on. I was like, I'm not putting shoes on because it's not part of the game day outfit. Those, I was like, these shoes are my Friday shoes and my Monday shoes, but not my Sunday shoes. And she's like, put the damn shoes on. And so I put the shoes on. Wentz throws a pick six right in the beginning of the game. And I said, nope, these are going in the garbage. <laughs> what? So I put the regular shoes on, and we, and we came back and won that game, although Wentz was out for the, for the uh, remainder of the season. Those shoes had something to do with it because those shoes never touched my feet in the beginning. Is that what led to the downfall of the relationship? You probably. Okay. Because I'm I'm a psycho. So, <laughs> but ever since then we won the Super Bowl. I wore that outfit every day until we won the Super Bowl. What happened last year? Uh, I, uh my pants don't fit anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the whole explanation for my, the Eagles season. My, my quads are so big, you know. Okay. That's that's <laughs> okay. Yeah. Working on my glutes. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> But I mean, I'm super. I'm super superstitious. I I can't help it. I'm like, for instance, the Mets when they went to the World Series. So that year, as you know, I, I was working for the Mets uh, before this, and that year Daniel Murphy gave me his socks. Okay, so I said like, well, if once they're in the playoffs, I'm, I'm, I'm wear Daniel Murphy's socks. You know, like give these guys some whatever. You know, to support my team. I put his. I put those socks on, and he went on one of the most incredible postseason runs a player has ever had clearly thanks to you you know he broke home run records and stuff like that so uh i was even up there for the nlcs against the cubs screw the cubs and uh daniel murphy i was wearing those socks he hit a home run in game one and game two and hit him exactly to to my section and seat See uh, what what is the overlying argument here? Like that there are forces at that, play the superstitions are real like okay like i i believe in it like i there's some type of connectivity in the world that allows you to relate in some sort. Do you want a rebuttal, Ben? Like the Matrix. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'd love to rebuttal the Matrix. <laughs> um, correlation does not equal causation. I think it's wonderful that you do that. Again, like I, 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 I love that. It, it's it's a great way to participate. But at the same, so here's the thing. There are when when New York when the, when the um, I'm just going to use an example. It's it's not it's not a current. Um, mm-hmm. It's not a current rivalry, but just to put two big cities in there. Let's pretend the Knicks were good. Yeah, we'll definitely have to pretend. <laughs> pretend. You know, Knicks versus Lakers. L.A. is a town of, I don't know, I'm going to go 5 million people. Uh, New mm-hmm. York is a town of 7 million people. So this is actually an interesting question. Are there certain cities that are more superstitious than other ones? And I'd, I'd love to see... I'd love to see if we could figure out why that would be because if, if super- well, Boston's definitely one of those. I mean, think yeah. about the the Red Sox and and you know and the all this other. The, yeah, yeah. So if, if superstition was real, then then what I, what I would say is uh, the town, or the sports team with the biggest population 
would win every year because they have the most people right doing the superstition. I've thought a lot so, about that. Yeah, you know, for, for every ten people who are like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna eat this sandwich standing on my head because because I want Tom Brady to throw a pick six. There's ten people on the other side saying, oh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna drink this Heineken through, you know, through a straw because I want Tom Brady to throw a touchdown. Right. So, is right. it is it just is someone well, I, believing harder? Well, because like I, I think the the big picture around it is, you know, how much of an effect do you as an individual of a population of you know 350 million of the of just the United States to say, mm-hmm. you know, how much do you as one person have of an impact? Right. Right. And it's obviously the question of I, I'm I mean little. I am a nobody compared to anything, you know, especially me, you know. But I do feel that in some type of I, I, I guess like some kind of underworld like realm, that what you do and maybe what you and other people do has some type of push towards making something magical happen. You're you kinda talking about the butterfly effect a little bit. Right. The butterfly effect. Like like the movie with Hash and Kutcher. <laughs> Thanks for doing that. Yeah. Thanks for bringing him up. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, I mean, because I, and I, honestly, I watched The Matrix the other night, and you know, the Oracle was like, you know, watch out for the vase, and mm-hmm. you know, I was like, what vase? The vase broke, and she was, you know, and she asked the question. Is the bigger question is, would you have ever knocked down the vase if I hadn't mentioned it? And and that's like, okay, wow, <laughs> blew my mind. That's such a great question to ask. You know, it's like, would this have happened if you had not done that? And that's that's isn't that the greatest question of all? What couldn't it's one of them. What couldn't have been if you didn't do this? Right? Yeah. I I have wondered at, at, at times, you know, the odds of me, the amount of things that had to happen in that order, in those moments for me to meet my wife. Mm hmm. The, mm-hmm. the, the woman of my dreams, the person who I love, and I'm going down the road forever, is so crazy fragile. I had to get into this school and not get into that school and get into this school and not get into that school and go here and go yep. here and this and that. And it's crazy. And I wonder, and I, and I wouldn't trade any of it for anything because I'm so happy, but, I, but, I, but part of me wonders, not like, oh, I wish it were different, but what amazing things just passed right by. We're, mm-hmm. we're, we're just, they needed 10 coincidences. Mm-hmm. But they only got nine. I think this is a fascinating question. I want to bring it in another direction. The people who we're sitting around this table with right now, this is why I don't take friendship for granted and and why it drives me crazy that people do. Because in a world with seven plus billion people, the point zero 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 repeating repeating one percent of the population that we actually know and come into contact with like you said the amount of things that have to happen that you have to live in the same area that you have to go to the same places the amount of things that have to go into actually knowing somebody and becoming friends that's why i don't take friendship for granted because the odds of meeting anyone in this world are so insurmountable that to me it's special i know that's cheesy as all hell no i mean i I but i've always it's similar to what you guys were just talking about and it's always very interesting and i think about it constantly too because i would i generally think that Without all the mess ups I've had in my life and all the the crap that I've done, I don't think I would be sitting here doing radio or sports reporting like I want to. Like, like the biggest question is like, oh, what would you be doing in life? Like me, I I have no no clue. Like I am not talented whatsoever in anything. So <laughs> it's like the question is like, what would you do? I I don't know. Like. Like, I grew up poor. I couldn't afford school, you know? Like, I'm a videographer, and I do radio, and I talk about and write about sports. Like, I got lucky. I got a I got a lucky break. But how many times, you know, did I have to do things a certain way or have to go through these certain steps to actually be where I am? Like, to, to go way back, I think 2000, 2009, you know, it's like... Okay, I was a security guard. I asked the editor, what do I have to do besides go to school to become a journalist? And he wrote, go to school. I'm like, well, thanks. I, that, that didn't help me out any. <laughs> and he just told me what I wanted to avoid. Mm-hmm. And then I'm working as a security guard, and then I met my son's mother. And then, because somehow that has to relate to it, because I ended up getting a job at the newspaper. And then I ended up wanting to be in radio and then all, all these other things just kept mixing in and you're like how the hell did i get here yeah it's, like, it's like it's almost overwhelming yeah and and if it's and it's funny because i'm gonna bring up the simpsons because the simpsons start out every episode exactly how your life is is that the simpsons start out with one 
point and somehow it has nothing to do with the beginning. And that's how life is because you do one thing and somehow you're looking back at it like, what just happened? This had nothing to do with what I was doing right here, but now I'm over here. Hmm. Got a couple more things. Got to let Ben get out of here soon. So we got a a couple of last questions for him. And I know I almost shudder to bring this up with how little time we have left, but I I really wanted to get your opinion before we got out of here on this question. And and if you said one of my previous questions was very open ended, you're going to you're going to laugh at this one. But my basic premise is what's happened to society's empathy. Like, I feel like, <laughs> I know, he's already laughing over there. I know. It he almost is, had a brain aneurysm. <laughs> I know this is a horribly open-ended question. No, I that, love it. I love it as a question. What happened to society's empathy? Because I feel like every day we've, as a society, whether it's social media or whatever, so many factors have gone, gone into, and Elliot and I talk about this almost every single week on the show, how social media makes everything so easy in our lives to hate on each other, and we sit behind keyboards, and we're just angry, and we argue, and there's no there's no debate anymore. It's just, I'm right, you're wrong, black and white, uh, left and right. Yeah, I have uh, a troll account just to make fun of Andrew, you know? We I mean, always talk about this every single week, right? So, <laughs> so my question is, I don't think it was always like this. You know, we hear stories about how, you know, our parents left their doors unlocked. You know, I, I feel like society's changed a lot, and I know there are a couple of not so obvious answers, but there, there are definitely things that come to my mind on, on this situation. I know you're, <laughs> you're racking your brains over there to try to, to put this probably in the right way. But to me, I feel like as a society, we have to find a way to get some of our empathy back because I think too many of us are at each other's throats. And, and one of the main messages of this podcast is to spread love, not hate. And I'm curious to get a psychologist's opinion on what we can possibly do. You know, it's it's a it's a very good question, and I think I think there's a level of complexity to it that that, that makes it tricky because, at the same time that I, that I look, I have the general feel that we are doing. I mean, you know, I, I think there, you know, we could easily make an argument that we are doing worse empathically now than we have in in a long time, but I think we could also make the argument for the opposite. I think we could also make make the argument that this is the best we've ever done. We talk about, um, and I, I, I would very much like to point out that again, I am a, I am a 32 year old who does not under there's the the amount that I understand is is the is the pebble of sand in the in the uh, football stadium compared to what I do not understand. Sure. So the, and these opinions are on the spot and not you know I, I might I could easily be convinced otherwise if, if information presented itself. But at the same time, I think this is. This is almost the best we've ever been. I mean, look, you know, our, our, our grandparents talk about a generation of leaving of leaving doors unlocked. And that's great. But at the same time, there were separate drinking fountains. I think I think that while we've lost a little bit of empathy, I think I think we've I think we've gained we've gained a, a lot of tolerance. And it's almost it's almost like empathy is this not is this non renewable resource. It's easy if I'm in a room with 100 people and I want to have empathy for 10 of them. It's pretty easy, but I'm going to forsake those 90 others in order to have empathy for, for, for those 10. And 50 years ago, 60 years ago, those 10 people were, who's my clan? The, they are you know, the straight, white, middle class male. You know, that, that's who you have that empathy for and you don't and you don't go across that aisle, whatever the demographic that would make that aisle would be. Would be. Um, if you ask me to have empathy for 100 people in a room full of 100, I don't think I get I, I, I can't I don't think I can take my level of empathy and multiply it by 10. I think I'm going to have to give everybody a smaller slice of empathy. And I think what we're asking each other to do, as, as we should, is have empathy for everybody, have empathy for everything. Which I think is good, but it, but it's it's a it's a tall ask from from where we've from where we've been not you know not 50 years ago not 20 years ago, so I, I think we're doing the best that we can. I don't think it's a I don't think it's a generational thing at, at all. Truth be told, the anonymity that the internet provides is is a big part of it, but I, I think that it's just it, it, a lot of it is just now we're trying to care for everybody, and 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 the sad thing is like. If I care for 90% of people, if I'm somehow able to push my limits and I have empathy for 90 of the 100 people that someone's going to point out, they might not even be in the 10% that I'm excluding, but but someone's going to point out, now you're not caring about these 10 people and, and that's not okay. And it, and it almost feels like I just put in so much effort and I'm still getting, I'm still getting crapped on for it. 
So maybe it's going to be easier for me to just kind of circle the wagons and, and get back to my little crew and, and screw everybody else. And it might not even be about race. I, you know, getting in a fight online with someone, they could be the same exact thing that I, that I, that I am, the sure. same race that I am. I don't know if that answers your question at all. It's weird. I, I think we're doing the best we've ever done. And I think we're, but I, but I do definitely see how the tide, it does feel like we're backsliding, backsliding a bit. Maybe it's, maybe it's, um, you know, competition for resources. You know, we, we, we this is, this is the first time, you know, in, in the history of humanity, the past 200 years, which is a, in the blink of an eye, I mean, just the blink of an eye in terms of just our existence, you know, I don't know, we're not going to have enough time to Google it, but I'd be curious if anyone at, at their house wants to do this. Google what the largest city in the world was in the year 1800, okay. and what that population is. And then let's let's Google what, you know, Tokyo, I think right now it's Tokyo, 45 million. The, the Roman Empire, the city of Rome at that moment, is smaller than Pembroke Pines, I, I believe. Right. Um, so to go from towns where you knew everybody. Beijing. Beijing in, in 1800 it was? Yeah. What was the population? 1100, or I'm sorry, 1. <laughs> 1. 1.1 million. 1.1 million in Beijing. What's the population of, of, of Fort Lauderdale right now, if you don't mind? Uh, Fort Lauderdale, wow. You know, you got a lot for me to do right now. <laughs> Yeah. I'm just kidding. Where's the apathy, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Fort Lauderdale, I'm sure that's a big population. 182,000. Okay. That's going to be the greater Fort Lauderdale. That's not, sorry, that's not greater Fort Lauderdale. That's going to be the town of Fort Lauderdale. Sure. Yeah. If we were to talk about Broward County, which is just, I mean, that, that we're talking in the order of, I mean, I guess you're going to look it up right now, but Yeah, of huge. course. That's the 1.74 million. Okay. So, so the population of Broward County, that's where I'm from. That's why I said Broward instead of Palm Beach. Is, is one and a half times the size of the biggest population of the biggest city in the world only 200 years ago. Sure. 200 years, that's 10 generations, maybe less, um, depending on, a, you know, I know age of, of, of giving birth is, has gone up as of, as of late, but that's, that's crazy. And think about this also, what percentage of the population had access or produced, had the means of production for their own food? Back then, I'd be willing to guess it was somewhere in the order of the, the 10 to 20 percent of people were actually making their own food. Now, point, I mean, how many farmers are in, are in America? Yeah. Six? Are right. there six farmers that feed all of us? Right. When's the last time you got your water out of a well that was yours? Never. You, you didn't. So I, think, I wonder if part of our lack of empathy is the fact that we are now so far removed from producing the things that keep us alive, hmm. food, water, shelter, that that that... that a lot spikes of- our anxiety a little bit and makes us and makes us have that kind of clan mentality of I got to protect my own and anyone who's not with me is a potential threat and even potentially a little taking for granted certain things I would think yeah based on that so there's my hey, odd, I mean it was odd a, answer it was a super open question I'm I'm always happy to get your perspective on things I'm gonna ask you one more and then we're gonna get out of here sure um because this we're gonna ask you to this is the question that we ask every single guest that comes on the show you can step back at, you're gonna have a different perspective obviously being a psychologist but you can step back from that role right here um and the general question is what makes ben happy and the reason why i asked this question is because every single week we want to get our guests opinion on what they do for their own mental health because as we oh, say every I can, single I can week answer this question in 30 seconds okay i can answer this question in one word and then i'll expand on it okay great so but the goal of this as we usually expound upon on the show is that there are people listening to the show who are unhappy there are people who want a little more from their lives they want uh, a source of happiness they, they need something and what i suggest as a mental health exercise that works for me may not work for them what elliot says makes him happy may not work for him but if one guest comes on this show and that's the one thing that that one person needs to hear and we can make one person happier that would mean a lot to me so that's why i just want this changes my answer (laughs) no i want to hear i'll give you both yeah give me both because i want to know you know we want to give people out there that one thing that might just make them happier in, in life. So I'm curious what makes Ben happy. And I, I know you're, okay. now you're so going I'll, a different I'll do, way. I'll do what makes Ben happy. And then I'll, and, and what I think, and then how I would expand upon that. Sure. So what makes Ben happy? One word relationships, relationships, simple as that, whether it's with my wife, my parents, my friends, my pets, I have, I have 11 pets in my house right now. And I, lo- and I, and that, that brings me a lot of joy, dogs and cats and snakes and birds and turtles and lizards and whatever. Wow. Um, oh yeah. my big, big animal guy. <laughs> but to me, it's, it's, it's about forming relationships. And here's the best, best example I can give would be this. I was, I was shooting around playing basketball just by myself. Like I, you know, I got a couple hours to kill. I'm going to go over to the gym, shoot around. No one's, no one's in the gym. 
which part of me was like, oh, cool, I've the gym myself. This is going to be great. After about 45 minutes of shooting around, like actually kind of drilling myself on elbow jumper, elbow jumper, whatever, I was like, oh, well, I'm bored. Time to start shooting half court shots. And I made, I made like a half court or like a two thirds court shot. And I was like, yeah. And I looked around and there was no one there. And immediately I was like, I don't care. No one saw that. I shared that with nobody. It may as well not have happened. Not because <laughs> no one's going to believe me, but because if there's no one in this moment to share that with, then then what was the point? Sure. Um, that's why I get frustrated when people have their phones at concerts. It's not just because the light is distracting, and that's part of it, but it's because they're choosing not to share in this moment with me. They're choosing to, like with, with the fans, if I stand up and for Kawhi Leonard, to, well, not him anymore, but <laughs> DeMar DeRozan to make a bunch of, of shots, and no one shares in that moment with me, I'm not going to do it, not because I feel silly, but because I feel alone. It's about, it's about relationships. It's about, con to me, life is about connecting with those. That's what makes me happy. That the reason I said my answer is going to change if we're talking about other people is that's not always the answer for the people. Some people aren't as interested in relationships, and some people struggle to, struggle to form them because of their own anxieties. When what, what I would say to that is, I, I think if one word could make most people happy, I would think it would be relationships. But for those who aren't out there, I don't know the word meaning comes to mind, finding a way to impact the world around you. But then again, you're not, I'm not impacting the concrete. I'm be impacting others, which implies I'm forming relationships. So maybe my answer doesn't change. Maybe it's just hmm. relationships kind of through and through. That, that's, that's, that's my key to happiness. And I think in, in an ideal world, which grants we are far from that, that's going to be the big thing for me. Fantastic. So our final segment on every single week of this show is spreading some love. And that's when we just basically shout out someone, something in our lives that uh, is that we're proud of, that's working hard out there, that's that's doing good things. And, and it doesn't even have to be anyone, you know, uh, out of this room. And that, that's what I'm going to do this week for my brother Elliot over there. Uh, I'm going to spread some love over to him because he just had a birthday, which is a big occasion over there. And um, you, you don't want you don't want the love. No, I like the love. OK. Don't remind people I'm getting old. You're, you're still younger than both Ben and I, so you're, you, you can calm that down. You're not. You're I definitely feel, not old. I feel old. That's okay. Um, but I, I definitely wanted to sh show some love in your direction. I know that you know we haven't been friends all that long, but um, you know, in what I've learned from you, you're, you're a really good dude. Um, I see how you are with your son, and it, it blows me away the the kindness and the empathy and the, the things that you show him, the experiences that you bring him, even if you don't have a ton. Uh, that you just you make sure to to bring him to these crazy cool events and be a really cool dad, and uh, that's that's super awesome, man. And I know you said, don't forget my birthday, don't forget my birthday. I want my present. I didn't bring you anything, but I the one thing You're that fired. I fired <laughs> the one thing that I do know about you, and this is even away from seeing things on the internet, just the amount of references that you've made on the show. Um, I'm going to make a donation for you to St. Baldrick's because I know that's your cause. Um, oh, wow. So I wanted, I wanted to share that with you. Oh, on I appreciate today. that. Yeah, I love St. Baldrick's, man. And, uh, Frank uh, Manino, he's the man. Uh, I love that dude. He, he does great causes for them. Uh, yeah, I, uh, for, I appreciate that, Andrew. Uh, it's very kind of you. And I'm going to kind of point – I'm going to kind of continue with what you were saying. Um, as far as this week being my birthday week, uh, you know, I give a shout-out to uh, – my friend Sean, Joe, and uh, my best friend of all, Jimmy, and of course, you know, you and our relationship, it's great. Uh, it's nice to have friends that don't expect anything from you. You know, um, you know the question of empathy, where has it gone? Um, it doesn't relate to them, that question, because, you know, they don't do anything with anything in return or anything expected in return. And, and it's nice to have that, you know, like, hey, let's just go do something. Oh, you don't have the money or you don't have the means. It, it doesn't matter. Let's just go have fun. It's not about when we pay each other back or anything like that. We're friends. We know that we'll always pick each other up whenever we need. And, and, it's, and it's awesome to have that. You know, it's like nothing's ever expected and you can do no wrong and you could do no right, you know. It's it's just a let's be friends, and so that's it's awesome to have that kind of friendship. Definitely, yeah. I know we put you on the spot here, Ben. But is there anyone in ninja class that's doing well, or is there anyone that's really impressing you that you want to give some love to? I've been doing a phenomenal job over the past, <laughs> crushing. Um, I'll give a long term and a short term one. Yeah. Long, long term, my wife she she, she changes people's lives she's also a psychologist and she changes people's lives on a, on a daily basis and it's in, it's incredible to get to witness that um 
So shout out to the wife. Hey, baby, if you're listening. Um, <laughs> as far as as far as like a local one, um, guy is about to open his gym, uh, and I think that's super cool. Uh, did he talk about that last week? Oh yeah, I gave him a shout out last week yeah. for that. <laughs> um, I think I'd have to send one to him. I, it's 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 scary starting your own business. Yep. So I you know I wish him the best of luck and look forward to um, helping him out however I can and, and continue to do stuff for Coach Casey down at um. Uh, at ATP, uh, and which is which is doing wonderful too. So, shout out to her as well, I suppose. Ben, thanks for joining us, man. It was my pleasure. Thanks, thanks for having me, guys. Definitely. So, for Elliot Brownstein and Dr. Ben Backus, I'm Andrew Ember. Thank you, everyone, for tuning into the No Name Fit Game. We'll get with you guys next week. <laughs>